The ACU football team is back at Wildcat Stadium for Homecoming 2017. I'm Hannah Nall. And I'm Grant Boone. We'll preview today's game against Southeastern Louisiana and look back at ACU's greatest homecoming game ever. It's the Adam Doral Show right now. Welcome to week seven of the Adam Doral Show from the campus of Abilene Christian University. I'm Grant Boone, alongside the head coach of the ACU Football Wildcats, Adam Doral. Hannah Knoll will join us in a bit. It is homecoming weekend. Had the ACU Sports Hall of Fame induction last night, the parade this morning, reunion dinners tonight, the musical, fittingly, Cats, and the Football Cats take center stage at Wildcat Stadium this afternoon at 2.30. Coach, in the frenzy of a homecoming weekend, how much do you want your team to soak up in the homecoming festivities, how much do you want them to block out? Yeah, a little of both. I mean, you want them to uh, definitely embrace homecoming. Uh, it should be, it should give them a heightened, I think, sense of awareness of how important the game is and how important the university in this place is to so many people. But at some point in time, you know, we started by talking all week by saying, hey, we got one job and that's to win the game. So mm. a little bit of both. That'll make everybody happy Absolutely. if you win the game right. That'll, that'll enjoy the game even yeah. more. Well, we're going to honor the 1977 football team during today's game. 40th anniversary of their NAIA National Championship. DeWitt Jones, the head coach, he's a frequent visitor to your yeah. practices. How important is it for your players to know at least a little bit about the history of the, of the program they play for? Yeah, I think it's very important. Uh, I, 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 you know, it's what you want to strive for as a football coach. And uh, for me, I love seeing DeWitt and Wally and, and those guys come back and be around because uh, it's been done here before, so it can be done again. And it's great when other people are reinforcing as coaches what we're saying to them. So uh, it's going to be super exciting to see a lot of those guys. I've had the uh, pleasure of meeting a few of those guys already throughout the year and, and since I was hired. And, you know, they are super passionate about ACU and, and what it's meant to their life. Well, the game, of course, takes center stage 230 kickoff. We'll preview that game against Southeastern Louisiana in just a bit. But when we return, highlights and Coach Doral's analysis of last week's nail biter at Nichols. Stay with us. It's the Adam Doral Show. Welcome back to the Adam Doral Show. Another week, another top 25 opponent for the ACU football team. The Wildcats went down to Thibodeau, Louisiana to tangle with the Nichols Colonels. Jonathan Rates has the highlights. In a game where over half the points came off special teams, Nichols State converted a school record five field goals while senior Nick Grau moved into second place all time in ACU history with his 42nd and 43rd field goals of his career. Early on though, it looked like ACU might find its groove offensively as senior DeAndre Brown found the end zone from 34 yards out to cap off the opening drive and give the Wildcats a 7-0 lead. The touchdown was Brown's longest gain of the season and he finished the day with 73 yards receiving before adding 32 yards on the ground to eclipse the 100 yard total yardage mark for, for the first time this season. But on the Wildcats' next possession, Nichols counted. Forced to punt from his own end zone, junior transfer Simon Larea had his punt blocked and the Colonels recovered the ball in the end zone for a touchdown. It was the second time an ACU punt had been blocked this season, and both times it has resulted in seven points for the opposing team. Kicker Laron Fonseca would give the lead to Nichols at 10-7 with a 27-yard field goal, but he would also add a 43-yarder midway through the second quarter to push the lead to 13-7. Grau answered with a 36-yarder to cut the lead to three again with just 3.34 remaining until halftime. With 1.31 left in the half, Chase Forcade orchestrated a scoring drive aided by a 13-yard pass to Dijon Dixon to push the Colonels near the red zone. And with less than 30 seconds to go in the half, Dontrell Taylor darted in for the score to give Nichols a 20-10 lead heading into the break. Taylor was a one-man wrecking crew piling up 158 yards of total offense, 130 of which came on the ground. After another Fonseca field goal, the Wildcats settled for a 22-yarder from Grau to keep the deficit at 23-13. Fonseca converted his second 40-plus yard attempt of the game to give Nichols its largest lead at 26-13. The two-possession lead was short-lived, though, because on the ensuing possession, junior quarterback Dallas Seeley connected with sophomore Tracy James on fourth and goal, and James powered his way in for the touchdown. Like Brown, James also finished with 100-plus total yards from scrimmage, and Seeley compiled a 323 yards through the air and the two touchdowns. 
but Fonseca was automatic on the day and closed the door with his longest field goal of the game, a 44-yarder with just over six minutes left in the game to bring the score to 29-20. It was this conversion that set a school record for Fonseca with five makes in one game. Wildcats fall to 2-3 and three in conference and 2-5 and five overall. ACU returns home Saturday to take on another top team in the Southland Conference in southeastern Louisiana. The game is sold out as the university will also be celebrating homecoming. Okay, Jonathan, thank you. 29 to 20, the final score against those nationally ranked Colonels of Nichols. Coach, you got the ball to start the game, and on the second play from scrimmage, Tracy James up the middle, 48 yards, the longest run of the season by any Wildcat. And then on third and 14 from the 34 yard line, Dallas Seeley finds DeAndre Brown out in the flat. He gets into the end zone. 90 seconds into the game, it's 7 0. Why did those big two chunk plays work? Well, good execution. Uh, they were both new plays that we hadn't shown this year. And, and bottom line, if you look at Tracy's and DeAndre's run, um, great second effort on both of them. And it was a heck of a way to start the game. Yeah, it looked like DeAndre dragged at least two or three yes, guys with him into he the did. end He did. He made a guy miss initially and then lowered his pads and finished it off. And that was great to see from him. And, you know, that's been something we've been wanting to see from him this year and Tracy. And, uh, you know, we feel like we really got Tracy going north and south. And he's really good when he gets his pads down and, and does that. You know, we talk at times about some of the struggles of the offense, but you've got eight guys now who've caught a pass for at least 30 yards, and you've got four guys who've had a run of at least 20 yards or more. So the chunk plays are beginning mm -hmm. to pile up. You're up 7 nothing. You force a three and out. Your defense does, and all of a sudden things are looking good. Then they force you to punt, and the punt gets blocked. Yeah. It was five minutes into the game. So you usually don't say a turning point yeah. happens five minutes into the game, but was that the turning yeah, point? Yeah, I think it was. You know, uh, that was a big turning point for us and the fact that we went one for four in the red zone, uh, you know, field goals and touchdown ratio. And yeah. so that definitely was uh, the, the turning point and super disappointed because we worked so long and so hard on the punt team. And, you know, that's the third one we've had blocked this year. And uh, you went back and looked at it, and it was just very poor execution across the board. Uh, one of the guys went the wrong way on the direction mm. and he let his guy come scot free and then you know the the, the bad thing is Grant we probably should have had two more blocked because we had just crucial errors on that team so that's something hopefully we got cleaned up this week. 13 to 7 then you get a Nick Grau field goal it's 13 to 10. You then force a punt from them you get the ball back late in the first half a couple of sacks you then have to punt and then you get this really critical double whammy they score a touchdown with 26 seconds to go in the half they get the ball to start the second half, get a field goal. It was all of a sudden, it's 23-10. Yeah. I thought it was a closer game yeah. than that. Didn't yeah. it feel like a closer it's, it game? It certainly did, yeah. You know, and it, it was it was one of those things where um, it just kind of snowballed on us a, a little, little bit. bit right there. Yeah, it did. And it, it, I was proud of our guys because I thought we were grouped decently at halftime. And uh, there's no question in our mind as a coaching staff, we played so much better in the third and fourth oh. quarter. We were very disappointed in our energy to start the game. and. You know, I know it was hot, but it was hard. It was hot for their team too. Hot for them too. Uh, and so that's just one of those things we got to learn from our our mental toughness and our grit to be able to overcome adversity like that. And you know, those are those are things you really have got to try to improve in the off season. You did show grit. Yeah. You come back. You make it 26 to 20. Yeah. Uh, on a fourth down play, mm -hmm. Dallas finds Tracy James. It looked like a heck of a catch. It it, was. He, he turned around. The ball's right on him. Right on his hip. It looked like, and he held on. Tracy's shown us in, in the last year and a half since he's been at ACU some flashes of brilliance. I mean, running and catching. How high is the ceiling for this sophomore from Dallas? Yeah, he's a good player. And the thing that we're really trying to get him to focus on is, is how he practices. Not, not that it's bad or anything, but just bringing a little bit more attention to detail on how he practices mm. his drill work. And he's a guy with, uh, if you look at his body of work, not just from a football, academically, socially, uh, it, the, t the kids love him. He's a great yeah. teammate. He's one of those guys that we're really trying to get involved in the leadership aspect of it. And, you know, a guy's got to want to do that, but he certainly has the skill set uh, to do that. And that's something moving forward. Hopefully we can really spark in him. Maybe a captain one Absolutely. day. Absolutely. Got that it's, kind of potential. Yes, he does. Yeah. He certainly does. Uh, they get the ball back. They kick a field goal. Laurent Fonseca, their guy, kicks five field yeah. goals, earned special teams player of the week. And so when I look at this game, final score 29 to 20, coach, you have 400 yards of total offense. You hold them to 300 yeah. yards. You didn't turn the ball right. over, and yet they get five field goals and a block punt they recover for a touchdown. So I guess I should pay more attention when you say, when I ask you what's the most important thing, yeah. and you say special teams. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was a special teams game, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It certainly was. And it was 
for us and, and for our program, it's the worst we've played all year on special teams and in every facet. Our kickoff return team won good, kickoff team won good, and again, it was so, it's it's frustrating uh, for our organization because we've been really good on special yeah. teams all year and uh, we spent a ton of time on it. And so to get outplayed like that on special teams is something, you know, obviously we got to learn from. Well. A chance to even the conference record today in this homecoming game at 3-3 three and three against Southeastern Louisiana Wildcats Stadium. 2.30 kickoff. We'll preview that game a little later when we return, though. Hannah chats up the quarterback from the greatest homecoming game in ACU history. And as we go to break, take a look at scores from around the Southland Conference last week. Thanks for joining us on the Adam Doral Show. Welcome back to the Adam Doral Show. Later on, we'll get the chance to hear from ACU Football Hall of Fame member Jim Reese. But first, let's hear from Max Preston about the rest of the sports going on at ACU. The women's cross-country team finished 18th overall out of 43 schools at the Adidas Pre-Nationals this weekend, while the men finished 21st out of 24 schools. Michaela Hackett had the best finish for the women at 32nd out of 287 runners, while her sister Allie finished close behind at 35th. For the men, Ryan Cleary had the best finish, coming in at 84th out of 215 runners. Both teams will next be participating in the Southland Conference Championships on Friday, October 27th. The men's basketball team has been projected to finish at 7th in the conference this season, a year after going 7-11 in conference and finishing at 9th in the 2016-2017 season. Point guard Jalen Franklin and center Jelani Friday were named to the Southland Conference pre second preseason team, giving the Wildcats a good start to, the, to their campaign. Head coach Joe Golding says he's optimistic about the upcoming season. I like where our team is. I, this is a very close team. It's a team that works very hard. Uh, it's a team that, like you said, that has a bunch back. I think we know each other. We know the strengths, and I think they definitely have gotten better. I think you, you, there's definitely improvement. Uh, I think our ACU community will see that right off the bat uh, in this group, but they have to go out on the, on, on the court, and they have to prove it, and we have to continue to coach them up and push them and find different ways to push their buttons to continue that improvement. Head coach Julie Goodenough and her back-to-pack -back Southland Conference champs are picked to finish fifth this season after the departure of Susie and Lizzie Dimba, Alexis Mason, and Sydney Shellstead. However, the Wildcats do have seven returners, including point guard Brianna Wright and Sierra Allen. Good enough said she's not worried about a preseason ranking. We're just excited about the season starting and, you know, preseason polls don't mean anything. It's just a way for us all to kind of put our opinion out there, I guess. Um, but it's something that definitely you put on the bulletin board and you make the most of it. Uh, but we're just we're excited about where we are right now in our practices and uh, looking forward to the season starting. The soccer team had a tough weekend going on a two game road trip and losing to McNeese Friday night three to nothing and losing to Lamar Sunday three to two. Defender Shea Johnson and midfielder Christina Ortega scored the lone goals of the weekend against McNeese. The women dropped to 6-9 overall and 4-4 four and four in conference with both losses. The team will next host Sam Houston State at Elmer Gray Stadium this Friday. That's all for this week. For more stories and breaking news, you can go to acuoptimist.com. And be sure to follow Optimist Sports on Twitter and Facebook for more. Until next time, I'm Max Preston. Thanks, Max. Homecoming weekend at ACU is packed with traditions old and new. Reunion dinners, club breakfast, the musical, the parade, and of course, football. Dating back to 1920, this afternoon will be the 89th homecoming game. And while there have been plenty of big wins and great moments, none will ever compare to homecoming of 1976. In a 17-0 win over East Texas State, Wilbert Montgomery became college football's all-time touchdown leader, and Ovi Johansson kicked a 69-yard field goal, which remains the longest in football history. The quarterback that day was Jim Reese, a second-generation member of the ACU Sports Hall of Fame and now the color commentator on ACU radio broadcast. I caught up with Jim earlier this week to get his reflections on an unforgettable day in ACU football history. So what do you remember about those days leading up to Wilbert's pursuit of the touchdown record? 1976 was right in the middle of the heyday where 15,000 fans were at Shotwell every game. So homecoming, this was homecoming. We we're playing East Texas. Uh, defense had, had already had several shutouts. We had a good record playing for a, you know, a chance to go to the playoffs. So <clears throat> everybody knew that Wilbert was one away from breaking the record. So. Uh, it was it was amazing because we always felt like Wilbert was probably the best running back. We would we would argue in the history of football, but at least in college football, including Division One. So there was a lot of excitement. Uh, 
that was kind of again when everybody came out to see us play at Shovel. So it was a good memory. You got to play with Wilbur and with Ova Johansson mm -hmm. and all these big people. So, and not to mention, y'all had a great record that season. It mm -hmm. was all around just a very memorable year of mm -hmm. ACU football. How was it playing with, it, with that team? Incredible because we had a lot of people forget how good our defense was. So, you had Chuck Sitton and uh, Ray Nunez and other All Americans. Those two, I think, are in the Hall of Fame. So, we had like seven straight shutout uh, victories for the defense, held them to no points. Wilbur uh, was again incredible. Even though he had had some injuries, he was healthy that game. In his senior year, he struggled with some of the injuries. Of course, his freshman year, he had this great national championship year. And then you had Johnny Perkins, who's a New York Giant wide receiver, Cleotha Montgomery, Wilbur's little brother, who was an Oakland Raider wide receiver. You had Ovi Johansson, that nobody knew how good he was. But so it was incredible. And then the day, the wind's blowing out of the north probably 35 miles an hour. Just normal pregame, but we noticed the wind's really blowing and it's out of the north. So it's a norther, typical norther in Abilene, Texas and West Texas. <laughs> uh, so Ova's doing pregame stuff and we noticed, and East Texas, who's now Texas A&M Commerce, noticed that he's going over to their 40-yard line to try a field goal. Okay, so that's like a 70-yard field goal. And they started asking him, I think it started harassing him, what are you doing over here? said, you're supposed to be kicking on your side. And he says in his great Swedish voice, which I can't imitate, uh, something like, I think he said, I'm going to set the record today for longest field goal, and I'm going to make one here in a minute from 70. Wow. So they sit there and watch him, and Dean Lowe's holding, and he kicks two from their 40-yard line. <laughs> so he freaked them out. He already psyched them out. Psyched them. So that was, that was probably that was the foretelling of something special is going to happen. Yeah. So you already yeah. expected one, but you got, you got two. Yeah, we got two. Broken. So Wilbur, Wilbur made like a, he ran a screen pass for 40, 50 yards, but he got tackled at the, at the one foot line. So that would have been great if he could have scored <laughs> this. That. And this, so we handed him a little die play and he barely got in for the, for the record. So that was a little anticlimactic. Yeah. But uh, I think it was right before half, wasn't it? So the field goal, uh, again, it's fourth down, we're supposed to punt, and Coach Bullington says, let's try it. So Ova comes out, and the rest is history. It's incredible, and he yes. made it. He made it probably with three yards to spare. So, so mentioning incredible things, yeah. you and your father are both Hall of Fame members. So how, how cool is that, that it's both of you? That's pretty cool. Uh, my dad, who died like five years ago, back in his last few years, he would talk about how cool it was that we were both in the Hall of Fame. And he would say something like, now are we the only two that are father, son? I said, no, Dad, remember that Ted Sitton and Chuck Sitton were both father, son. But those are the only ones that I know of until I think there's maybe somebody coming in this year or last year that where it was a father, son. But Dad was, the other thing that was cool, Dad was the PA announcer. So he was the public address announcer for 20 years at Shotwell Stadium. So Dad's broadcasting Doing the, doing the public address when all these records were happening. That's so that's pretty cool. Yeah. cool. yeah. So changing shifts, shifting a little bit, you've actually been radio broadcasting with Grant Boone. So tell me how that's been, being able to watch the game that you played. Right. And it just, how was that? I, I would have been freaking out thinking I'm going to hate this, but I love it. So <laughs> I, I, this is the biggest surprise. The fact that he asked me was pretty cool, pretty neat, pretty, it was amazing that he even asked me. And then doing it, I guess it's because I'm up here hiding and nobody can see me <laughs> that I can just be myself. So he's the announcer, he knows what he's doing, and I can just talk about football. Right. So that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah, and that's great. And so he's, he's been really good. We, we do prepare, but I can play off of him and basically just talk about what I see, which is not a lot of, I'm not good at numbers and names, but I'm better at just Let's talk strategy. Let's talk about what they're doing defensively, offensively, and situations in the game. Make you miss anything at all? No, because <laughs> I, I got really tired of really getting hit hard, so I had two or three concussions. I don't miss that at all. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thanks. It's, it's good to be here. Jim still holds the single game record for passing yards with 564. We'll be back to talk more about homecoming festivities on the Adam Doral Show after this break.
As we welcome you back to the Adam Doral Show, take a look at today's Southland Conference schedule. Ten of the 11 teams in action, including league-leading Central Arkansas. At Northwestern State, the Demons, AC's next opponent two weeks from today, they took Sam Houston State down to the wire last Saturday night in Huntsville before Sam scored in the final minute. Let's also take a look at the Southland Conference standings now. Here we are at the midway point of the conference season, Central Arkansas. With JCU plays in the final game this season is alone in first at 4-0, but four teams are right behind the Bears with just one loss. And that includes ACU's opponent at homecoming today, the Southeastern Louisiana University Lions from Hammond, Louisiana, down by New Orleans, who after losing their first three games of the year, Coach, they've won four in a row thanks to an offense that is cranking out touchdowns by the handful, averaging better than 50 points per game in this four-game win streak and doing it primarily on the ground, the best rushing offense in the Southland Conference. How do they run the ball? What, what's their scheme? Yeah, they're, uh, it's unique because they're utilizing uh, two different backs. Um, they've played four different quarterbacks this year. Mm. Very dynamic, but it's a, it's a spread option type of system. Uh, they don't want to throw the football. They want to run the ball. I think what really makes them challenging is their two backs. Both their backs are about 230 pounds. And, and when those two dudes get rolling downhill, they're hard to bring down. And they put them, you know, when you run option football, a lot of times you can get that kid the football when he's in a one-on-one -on -one matchup with the safety mm -hmm. or linebacker. And if those kids don't make those plays, um, and it's hard because they're running so low off the ground, but very good on the offensive line, uh, not turning the ball over. And then you've just seen a much better football team than the first three weeks. And you know, they were playing some good uh, teams. Yeah, they, they were, and the fact that they had so many transfers mm -hmm. that now, you know, once you get those kids together for a few weeks, mid middle of the season, they're just a much more cohesive unit right now. Yeah, two thirds of their team, in fact, are transfers either this year or last year. Does it help having played New Mexico at all? Having seen a team that runs yeah, oh, the Oh, absolutely. Option? Yeah, def definitely has helped us do that from a physicality yeah. standpoint. And Colorado State, uh, you know, if you continue to watch what Colorado State's doing right now nationally, and yeah, um, both those games will help us from that physicality standpoint, knowing what we're going to have to stand up to. Last thing, they are last in the league in passing yards allowed. Is that because they get so far ahead, other teams have to throw on them, or, or, or are they vulnerable in the passing uh, I defense? think it's a little bit of both. I think they gave up a lot of big plays early in the season. Mm. But, you know, again, in the last four weeks when they've been on this <laughs> run of scoring 50 points, yeah. uh, they're, they're, not, they're not giving up those big plays on defense, and they're getting two takeaways on an average on defense. So. Uh, they're doing some really good things on defense, too. Good news is your team has protected the ball three we straight have. games without a turnover. Homecoming always exciting. The Wildcat Country tailgating scene getting started as we speak right there in the middle of the ASU campus. Games at 2.30, pregame show for you beginning at 2 on 98.1 FM, the ticket, and around the world on ASUsports.com. For Hannah Nolan, for Coach Doral, I'm Grant Boone. Happy homecoming. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the game. We'll see you right here next week on the Adam Doral Show.